Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Su Fujimoto from Tokyo, and I'm an architect. And so, uh, I'm very, very happy to be here today. So thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, today, I'm afraid I brought too many images, so I will start quickly. The title is Nature, Between Nature and Architecture. It is really a fundamental theme. It, uh, architecture is, of course, really artificial. The nature is the opposite things. But I like to create some kind of a, how to say, meshing together, melting together, or recreate the new relationships between nature and architecture. And uh, not only nature and architecture, but I like to think about such an in-between concept, the between nature, architecture, and the landscape. Architecture and landscape, of course, different. But if you think about something between architecture and landscape, it is something new. Or the furniture and architecture, furniture and architecture, how we combine them together, the crossover, the different scales, or inside and outside, it is really fundamental, again, the concept, how we define architecture, inside and outside. But if we emerge, merge inside and outside, then it could be something new, and of course, nature and architecture. So this is the most, how to say, great example to think about such kind of an in-between concept, the Serpentine Pavilion. It is, and it's already gone. This summer it was, and uh, fortunately, this summer, the London weather was not London weather, it was so nice. So this kind of a transparent structure with uh, how to say, minimum roof works very much. And uh, yeah, this is, uh, this silhouette is the serpentine uh, old structure. And then the whole pavilion are made by the 20 millimeter uh, steel frames. And the grids, the modular is 40 centimeter and 80 centimeter combination. So it means 40 centimeter you can sit on and climbing up. So it is kind of a, like a landscape. You, where you can play with or you can stay uh, within. And this is the, uh, the Serpentine building, and the surroundings is a beautiful Kensington Garden Park, so it's surrounded by beautiful greens, and then our pavilions is here. And our intention is to create some kind of a new uh, definition of architecture. It's half architecture, but half kind of a nature, made by really strict grid, but the whole shape is very ambiguous. Strict, straight lines, but the experience is really soft and blurring. And uh, the transparency is changing according to where you are. So in some point, it's really transparent, but in other points, it's really dense and opaque feelings. And uh, of course, it has uh, many, many steps. So it's kind of like a furniture, giant furniture, or the melting uh, architecture down to the furniture. And uh, of course, it's, the whole thing is a structure. But at the same time, it's the roof, the wall, the structures. But everything is like, a, like an air. So it's kind of a, a new understanding. What is the architectural field? What is the behaviors of the people? Or what is the wall or structures and the roofs? Every kind of things I try to redefine. And this is the photos I took almost one year ago in London on site. Yeah, the autumn, the all the leaves falling down. So it is amazing because it's very simple, but it's really complex and rich. So this is the nature, I think, the amazing point of the nature. And architecture is, compared to this, architecture is too simple, too boring. So I try to create such kind of a richness and meeting point, melting point between nature and architecture. So this is the original inspirations. And then, yeah, throughout the whole process, we designed this. And the process was, it's quite short period. We started almost around this, the beginning of December, and then we have to finish the concept within one month. So we did every day the Skype or phone meetings with the directors. The director was, yeah, so impressive, uh, Julia Payton Jones and Hans Ulrich Obris. They are really strong characters. And when I sent the sketch, they said, no, 
This is not. This is too Fujimoto-like. So you have to avoid that. So then, next week, I send another sketch, and then they said, no, this is too not Fujimoto-like. <laughs> so, so how do they do the Fujimoto-like or not Fujimoto-like? So we struggled and uh, something. And finally, she said, OK, I will come to Tokyo on the New Year's Day, on the 3rd of January. So usually, we have a break on the New Year's Day. But then she said she will come. So we didn't have any Christmas, any New Year's Day. We have to work for the presentations. But then finally, when she came, of course, we made a model and we discussed about that. And she fully understand. And then she supported a lot uh, to realize this project. So it was a very, very great uh, process. And uh, yeah, this from outside, this is like a kind of a mountain. So you can uh, use these stepping, uh, like uh, seatings and something. And the basic programs of this pavilion is a cafe. So usually you can just come in and take a coffee and sit or uh, just climbing up or lying. And this is the entrance. So it is, everything is blurring. So it is not so clear, but you can come in through this inside. And then inside is something like this. And this area is a really big stepping auditorium-like things because usually this is a cafe, but the, sometimes they like to make the event, the lectures or party or something. So we created such an auditorium, like a mountain-like areas or open space and the two different uh, entrances. And you can see how the transparency is changing according to the directions. They're very, very transparent and opaque, and then up to the sky, something like that. And even such an old lady tried to climb up. So I was so happy. Children and old ladies and the dogs behave really freely. Yeah, it looks a bit dangerous, but uh, it's, it's fine. No, no problem about that. And uh, yeah, this is a sketch of uh, the process. Yeah. Yeah, we thought about, <laughs> in this sketch, yeah, kind of a, I don't know, this is Fujimoto-like or no Fujimoto-like. But uh, I was thinking about many, many steps for people to sit on or climbing up, but uh, not sure how to cover all the, the space. And then gradually, yeah, we make, usually we are studying this kind of a small model to uh, like a kind of a uh, live study change and uh, cut and uh, grew it. And then at the final moment, we made a really huge model because it's really complicated. So uh, of course, in the computer graphics, it's precisely uh, you can see, but you couldn't understand the space. So finally, we made the 1 to 10 scale model. So it's 2.5 meter, 2.5 meter. So it's really huge. With many students, we finally make it. And then we understand finally what it is. And this project, I have to say, it's the basic inspirations, basic influence from this famous Toyoito project to Sendai MediaTek. It was published in 1995. That was the moment I just was graduated from school. So it's a big shock for me. And uh, I was so envy, I was so fascinated by that. And the point is, Ito-san changed the columns. The columns is usually the object to change the object into the space. So the whole columns is like a space. So I understand this is a really big innovation to change such an usual object into a new space. Then architecture could be re-innovated in a various different way. So I was so fascinated by that. I like to do such a similar or something beyond that and then I made this project about 10 years ago. It is, Ito-san did change columns into the space. So I said, OK, so I will change floors into the something spatial floors. So dividing floors into smaller pieces and uh, make a layers to create furniture-like or uh, space-like things. So changing the object into the space is 
the basic creation, the basic uh, understanding of the new architecture for me. So that's the, what was the beginning. It was about 20 years ago. And then gradually, I developed that ideas. And then this is a conceptual model. And then this is a real private house. But again, you will see not only have the typical first floor, second floor, but the dividing the such a floors into smaller pieces, even dividing the roofs into smaller pieces, and recompose the whole space as a living environment. So it's more like focusing on the people's behaviors, not like uh, compositions, but more people's behaviors, and let people behave as they like. You can choose different levels according to your uh, activities, according to your feelings. So then, finally, such kind of a whole 20 years process uh, could create the, this uh, Serpentine Pavilion. So it was, it was a really long, long process. And you will see how the transparency, these areas are really transparent and then opaque, getting more uh, whitey, misty uh, feelings. They're like a white big mountain. And sometimes, yeah, this is the opening lecture. And it is so many hundreds of people are coming together to create like a, a human-made landscape like things. It's really amazing things. It's really massive at that moment. And for the dogs, it's a really like a paradise. We walk around, no walls, no or something, but you just go on up and uh, uh, behave as they like. And uh, this shadows is also quite beautiful because, of course, the structure is really thin, and then the floor is concrete. But if the shadow is coming in, then your experience is surrounded, even on the bottom, surrounded by these thin elements, like uh, surrounded by the, the air or something like that. So it is the beautiful moment of the, uh, of the, of the pavilion. Anyway, it's, it's quite, quite uh, fortunate, it's quite big success in London because of half because of the uh, nice London weather this year. But uh, it's, and for me, it's a very, very big experience because, yeah, as you know, the historically, this Serpentine Pavilion has been done by the kind of a big people, big monster-like Meister people. So I got a kind of a pressure to that. But finally, I think I could make the like a half Fujimoto-like and a half not Fujimoto-like uh, amazing things. And the uh, second project is, it's really funny, but the toilet, the public toilet project. This is the smallest project I ever did. And this is, the public toilet is a very exciting program because it is relating to the inside, the problem inside and outside, or a problem with the privacy and the publicness. And of course, the surroundings is a natural landscape, so nature and architecture things. And of course, relating to the human nature. So how we can re-innovate the public toilet? And this is the, the first drawings. Really huge natural field and toilet. That's the ideal toilet, I thought. And then how to realize it in a, of course, more practical world. So we did like this. Toilet and the roof, that's all. But of course, we have made the wall surrounding you. So it's, it is creating the block barriers for the privacy. But it, once you come into this territory, the areas, then you are free, you're open. Of course, you can make a lock for this wall area, and then you can behave as you like. You can do anything about that. So of course, the toilet is surrounded by the glass, but it's just to block the, the wind or rains. And then the inside is also natural uh, green grass and some trees. So it is dividing the skin in two pieces, the blocking the view skin and the creating the 
shelter for the weather. So dividing in such a, uh, skins and introducing the nature between such a divided skins to create the super different experience of that. From above, something like this. This is the wall. This is a toilet for women. So <laughs> it's a, and uh, only one, one for toilet and one more for the wheelchairs and uh, of course for the male or something like that. And this is just alongside the railway. But we carefully, of course, we carefully designed the height of the wall, not to see from this. If you are standing in here, you could see it. But if you sit on, it's blocked. The lower part is blocked. <laughs> and yeah, the plan is like this. So you can open the door and come in. Yeah, the whole area is your toilet. And finally, you can get it. So it is like this. And it's really, of course, it is a low budget. So we made this wall by the, how to say, just the piles uh, pushed it onto the ground. So it's really primitive. Uh, so I felt it's a fitting to the surroundings. And from outside, it is something like this. It's really minimal, the wall. And nobody imagined a toilet inside. And this is a door for women. And you will see the pathway leads you to the, to the toilet. And yeah, you will see the neighbor's house here. But yeah, don't worry about it. If you sit on, the lower part are blocked nicely. <laughs> and uh, yeah, something like that is uh, And this photo has been taken by Iwan Ban, the, as you know, the famous photographer. He's a very, very busy guy, but he spent the whole day only taken to this uh, toilet. And he get, he hires the, how to say, the lifting up uh, car to take uh, photos from above, yeah. So it's, it's, it's a great pleasure that he took such an effort to just to take one small pri uh, public toilet. And then I like to expand the scales of architectures. It's a competition proposals for the Middle East countries it's a huge, huge uh, album proposals. So between architecture and the city, it's a design of the long, about one kilometer street, shopping street, and the whole areas are the site. So we have to design the whole, for example, the Chanzerize, whole Chanzerize is a program. And then we proposed such kind of a really strange towers, and shopping centers combinations. The, the inspiration is this Bedouin tent, so the, getting from the, the local cultural things. And of course, the motif is of arch is such kind of a uh, Middle East culture. And then inside of the tower, we have a huge openings. It is creating the natural ventilations. The, because of this kind of a climate, we try to create such a natural ventilation, not too much mechanical ventilations. So this tower is for such a uh, uh, architectural ventilation systems. So this is it. The whole things are surrounding the void, the commercial programs, and the, some viewing, viewing decks and something like that. And on the bottom, we have uh, uh, the commercial areas. And then, yeah, this is a view from the one tower to the, the whole series of the towers. It's so different from my previous works, I'm afraid. But uh, of course, I never use such kind of a, oh, sorry, such kind of a, the shape of the arch or something. But without these kind of a practical or real shapes, you could find this is really, really similar to the serpentine pavilion, made by the grids. So a group of the huge numbers of the grids, then the whole shape is more free for, from that. So for me, it's continuous from the serpentine pavilion to this project, but the different scales, different culture, background, different programs. So that kind of a diversities of the project, I'm really, really enjoying because when we, finish the serpentine, it's okay. It's a really pure, beautiful structures. But when we try to 
bring such a concept, a great, great concept to some different size, different cultures, then new inspirations, new ideas should be come. Then it's, for me, it's really exciting how the ideas are unexpectedly growing to the different way and of course different size. So I'm trying to do such a, how to say, different things, not limit my uh, territories, but uh, more open to the possibilities. And this is the, and I was so excited to, to find out such an arch shape could create the layers to make a particles of the light coming in through. So how we can make the filters to block the sunlight. And of course, the block, the blocking the direct sunlight is another really practical requirement, but not only answering the practical requirement, but to get it beyond something and to create something beyond that. And in some area, it's really crazy, but uh, we have a whole water and the, the real shapes here. So it's, uh, I don't know, inside, but the whole outside feelings and the shopping areas. And they are this a night view. But the whole competitions, we did a lot. And we are arranging the presentation date. But suddenly, the competition itself has gone. They said the king of this country just decided to stop these competitions. So it's, uh, now it's gone. But uh, for me, it's an uh, exciting pro experience to be involved in such a things, and suddenly it stopped to understand. I understand that in the Middle East countries, every kind of things could happen. <clears throat> so, but I'm very curious how we continue these concepts in such an areas. And then, I'm coming back to the more smaller size again. It's in Taiwan. And uh, I'm now doing a four or five projects in Taiwan. And especially this is a smallest one and relates to the furniture and architecture or the urban situation and architecture. This is it. This is the cafe. The monsters of the staircases, the kind of a labyrinths or the eschers, drawings like things. But the, the starting point was very, very local. This is the, the small pathway of the Taiwan back street. And I really like these kind of feelings. It is not like a huge urban scape. It's more like a half architectural experience and a half urban space. And then, um, yeah, these kind of uh, continuities of the pathway, I was so fascinated by that. So I try to create something between these urban situation and the cafe architecture, integrating them together to create three dimensional pathways inspired by this. So these staircases is, for me, it's like a pathway going up and split and then coming together or the mixing together. So if you go up, you could choose where, which way to go. Going up, walk through under this another staircases and go around to walk up. And of course, the staircases is a place to sit on, uh, to, to have a relax. So, of course, we have uh, tables and chairs, but not necessary to sit on the tables. But uh, you will use these staircases as a part of the landscape to behave or to use for the cafe program. And, of course, these, the three-dimensional staircases could work as a shade. In Taiwan, of course, the sunlight is very strong. So we could try to create the shaded areas, not only inside, but the outside shaded areas with many, many trees surroundings. So it is creating the three-dimensional pathway, but then to create the protection for the rains and the sunlight, and to provide the various different uh, space for people to sit on or behave in a different way. So that is the concept. And again, this is it. So it, is, it has many, many staircases. And some of them, of course, three-dimensionally, it has the platforms, but not only platforms, but these staircases is a field for the cafe and is a field for people to, to walk around. So it's a half architecture and half the street-like things. But in Taiwan, I'm doing really big contrast, a really huge project, Taiwan Tower. It's a kind of a 300-meter high tower 
like an Eiffel Tower in Paris. On the top, we have a viewing deck, but uh, in between, kind of a, just a void, nothing. And uh, then in here, I'm told, thinking about the between object and void, something and nothing, and nature and architecture. And this is it. It's a kind of an anti-tower-like things. The originally, the tower is more like a really thin needle-like things. So we try to create more like a, a vast, spreading, really thin existence, but huge volumes, but really thin existence. So we have the contradiction of the object, but the void. We created the void by the object. And this is the simple history of the tower. Of course, we have a long history before, but the Eiffel Tower, then we have higher, 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 one kilometer, finally. It's getting the same shape, but getting the higher, higher. So we try to create the different story, different histories, change the whole concept of the towers, more getting fat, but more transparent, and more like our volumes or areas as a towers. And then, the followers could come, like a strange shape, but the voids, like towers. So to change the whole history from this point, it was a presentation. So made a contrast. Eiffel Tower, Taiwan Tower, 20th century, 21st century, Paris. So for Taichung people, yeah, Taichung will be the 21st century Paris. And then the machine age, and I don't know, environmental age. I don't know what it is exactly, environmental, but something like environment, an object, and more phenomenal, or like a more air-like things. And at the same time, I made the simple presentation relating to the Taiwan uh, nature and culture. So the first inspiration was to create the huge one big tree in the middle of the city. And then people will come to under the trees to have a chat or to have a communication. And I understand that in Taiwan, the trees is not like a one uh, trunks, but it's, it has a long roots going down from the, the branches to create more area. So I was inspired by that. So not to make the one line, but more to create the areas made by the trees. So 300 meter high uh, trees, that was the first inspiration. And then, of course, this is a Taiwan island, the beautiful green island. So put Taiwan on the top, the green gardens on the top. So combining them together to create the huge uh, tree-like, but of course bigger than the tree, uh, existence. That was a concept. And it has a, it's, it's so fat, so big, so it has a space in the middle. So it's kind of a public plaza, huge plaza but surrounded by the huge structures. And we have a opening skylights of the Taiwan shape. So you can see, wow, it's a Taiwan island on the top. And it is, of course, 300 meter high. So it's outside, but you will feel surrounded by these columns and structures. So almost like an architectural experience. It's really, really amazing, 300 meter high ceiling, one room. So it is another uh, concept to create the urban architectural rooms uh, for that. And it is now ongoing, ongoing. It's a really tough process to do this kind of a huge public project. But uh, officially, next year, we will start construction. And then, I don't know how long does it take to finish it, but uh, Taichung is the city of the, I think in a sense, architecture, because now the Ito-san's opera house is almost finishing. And then ours will start, and now the, this summer, the Sana Sejima-san won the competition to design a library and uh, exhibition space. So it's not quite a big city, but it has many, many uh, architectural pieces for future. So I'm really, look, really looking forward how these towers could be, uh, could be amazing or could be really, how to say, scary, crazy things. This is the 
art museum project. It's ongoing in Germany. And this is a landscape and architecture relationships. It's an extension of the Philip Johnson buildings in Europe. Yeah, they have only one Philip Johnson buildings in Europe in the really small town in Germany, the Bielefeld. And we, I did an exhibition in that museum, and then we talk about the possibilities of the extensions. And this is it. It's kind of a, the stacking landscape ideas because the whole site is something like this. The huge park, beautiful park, art site, and this is the Philip Johnson building. So the main part of this art space is the beautiful surroundings, beautiful park. So of course the program itself is to create the extension of this Philip Johnson building. Now the building itself is quite small. So how we create the extension of such a historical building. And I thought, it is not the extension of the Philip Johnson's, but should be the extension of the park. To create the extension of the park by architectural method, then it is more nicely harmonizing to the surroundings and to keep the Philip Johnson buildings as an icons of the art museum. So that is the, our strategy. Then we made many, many models. Yeah, this is our way to do it. And finally, this kind of a way to stacking up the landscaping and uh, covered by trees. We will put more trees here so people can go up, but not to the top. And then this sloping areas is the kind of an open terrace deck so people can go out to behave. So this is part of the like a serpentine pavilion, not like a grids, but the more smooth surface, but the more landscape open for people to behave as they like. And this is the program. So one level in underground, and then the exhibition space is more like a white cube. It's a no window, no irregular shapes. And then this sloping areas is more like a foyer for the lobby for the exhibition space. So going up and going down through these sloping areas. And every, on every level, you will have a terrace to going out to enjoy the landscape. So that is the concept. And again, this, this is it. And of course, this is just a conceptual proposal. So we are continuing to talking about it, but uh, not sure it will be it will be uh, realized or not. But uh, for us, it's a really nice experience to feel the really important historical context and the natural context, and to get it, to react it, but not only just react it, but something go beyond it to create the new uh, environment. And this is the last project. This is uh, in Japan, in Omotesando. It's a beautiful area, and many architects designed uh, the buildings alongside. This is a back street of the Omotesando areas. And between furniture and architecture, or the architecture and city, but anyway, this is something like this. It is, basically, it is uh, concrete frames, but sometimes it's split, the frame is splitting, and then on the, on the edge, is changing into the trees. So the whole thing is like a half artificial, half uh, real tree-like uh, structures. Because, yes, this is the typical uh, photos of the surroundings, the back street of the Motesando. And you will see how the Japanese urbanscape are made. It is made by many, many, many smaller things the small trees, the bicycles, and something, something. Every kind of a smaller things are coming together to create the living environment in the city. Again, yeah. And trees, many, many trees, but everything is very small and almost integrated into the architecture or integrating into the uh, urbanscape. So I was fascinated by that, and I tried to recreate such a things in a contemporary architecture. And then, of course, we started from really basic uh, volume models, but we tried to put some trees. But in this phase, it's just uh, pots on the, on the rooftop. And then, 
is getting bigger parts or longer parts, but still it's just a box and the, the vegetations on the top. Gradually getting, dividing into smaller pieces like a serpentine, but stacking up the tree parts, and then developing, this is the first presentation, stacking the tree parts on the top. But it is still, uh, for me, it's still too closed, not too open. And the clients also likes to make the more openness. So finally, it's something like this. I mean, the whole things are made by frame, so we can keep the huge openness. But the frame is changing into the trees, not in smooth way, but split like a trees, and then on the end, on the edge, it has a trees. So it is like the Omotesando uh, atmosphere. They put the tree pods, tree, small tree pods surrounding your house or uh, the surrounding the street, but the more architecturally artic uh, organized or integrated together. And I was surprised to see this idea. Of course, I made this my sketch by myself, but I was surprised because I never do such a frame things, a big frame things. Yeah, the serpentine small frames I have been doing, but the usual size frames I never did. And then from the frames, the trees is coming in. So it is quite uh, exciting for me. And the frame, of course, this is a four-story buildings, but then it is growing to the six-story or eight stories or 10 stories. So the whole integration of the nature and architectures are possible, not even in this size, to really more uh, creating a huge high-rise buildings. So it is just for this project, but at the same time, it is more open possibilities uh, to be developed in a different situations. And now it's uh, under design, and the construction will start next uh, January. And maybe in the end of next year, it will be there. And the Omotesando area is a very nice shopping area. So you can come just for shopping, of course, and then we will see uh, some of the nice architectures. And uh, to close this speech, I'd like to show two different images. This is the image of the Tokyo the shopping street one minute from my house. It is typical Tokyo. Every kind of a smaller things are gathering together to create the human scale, but at the same time, urban scale environment, Asian situations. And I like such a chaotic situations. And I was born in Hokkaido, grown up in, Tokyo, uh, grown up in Hokkaido, now based in Tokyo but growing up in Hokkaido. Hokkaido is like this, the place of the natures, surrounded by forest. And when I come to Tokyo the first time, I felt, of course, so different, but I felt comfortable. And I didn't know, I couldn't find the reason why I feel comfortable, so different situations. Usually it's bad, but I felt comfortable. And then, Gradually, I learn about the architecture, and I think about the, my architectural thinking, and gradually I am getting understanding. This Tokyo situation is quite similar to the natural forest, because natural forests are made by these smaller pieces. Of course, beautiful smaller pieces, but the tree leaves, and the branches, and some things are surrounding you. So it's a human scale, cozy scale, but at the same time, it's a really huge scales. And the Tokyo, of course, each element is not quite beautiful, but the scales and how it composed together and the whole size is quite similar. And then I was so surprised, these kind of a so different things has the same or similar impressions and as an experience and as a living environment. And then I thought, between nature and architecture, we could make it combinations. We could have a link, and we could make something between just the nature and just an architecture. So that's the, my roots and my uh, undergoing concept. So that is the, the end of my presentation. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Fujimoto-san. That was incredible, and um, I'm a huge fan. Thank you very much. And I just can't wait to experience your public toilet, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, just, it's interesting. I read this amazing quote from one of your publications about how the ideal architecture is really creating um, outdoor space as indoor space mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and an indoor environment to feel like an outdoor environment. Oh, yeah. And I think there's something very peculiar but particular about the way you deal with the specificity of a detail mm -hmm. and expanding that out. Mm -hmm. And I believe, you know, as long as we keep thinking about the detail, then the kind of quality of architecture can actually become very strong mm -hmm. yeah. for the experience and changing our behaviors. Yeah. Um, one, one aspect of um, your projects is also to make architecture disappear. Mm -hmm. And you nod and respect a lot of Ito-san's work mm -hmm. from the Sendai Mediatique. Yeah. But could you tell us a little bit more about your background in between Hokkaido uh -huh. and moving to Tokyo? Okay, yeah. yeah. In Hokkaido, my house was in the, yeah, something like that. This is a, was the, the photos of my garden. And uh, so nature field. So I didn't care anything about architecture things at that time. And when I come to Tokyo, I didn't decide to do architecture or not. I was more like to be an, uh, like an Einstein, like a physics uh, researcher things. But uh, I found out my brain is not powerful enough to do that. So I gave up. And then, of course, but th before that, from before that, I was so interested in the creative things. So Einstein things are also, for me, it's really creative to make a re-understanding of the whole world. And then, I just to make a casual decision to do architecture at the, at the beginning. Mm. And then gradually I, I learned a lot, and uh, starting from Le Corbusier and the Mies van der Rohe, fascinated by them. So starting from a really Western, modern architecture uh, background. And then after graduation, I didn't know how to do it, how to be an architect. I was so shy. So I couldn't go to, for example, Ito-san's office to show my portfolio because I was afraid when Ito-san says, hmm, not bad, but not good, then it's almost <laughs> the end of the, the world or something like that. So I couldn't do that. And uh, I was so uh, shy. Then I just was alone and I started my uh, office automatically because I just was alone. But of course, no commissions, no project. But I just start to think about architecture by myself. Mm. Then, now. <laughs> Great. Yeah, because I think you're offering a huge inspiration to a lot of younger architects. In our audience today, we have a, a wide range of professional architects um, and also visitors from around the world. I'd like to open up to the audience mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. engage with some discussions and conversation. Yeah. And I believe I see William Lim, my dear friend, who's also the president of the AIA Hong Kong mm -hmm. chapter, who's also, uh, I think, one of your fans. And William, I'm would you like to start? Hi, I'm a big fan of yours. Thank you. And uh, actually, uh, two, two months ago, I took a bunch of, uh, I took 12 students from the University of Hong Kong uh, to, to your office. You weren't there. Um, mm -hmm. And your, your staff, your, your team was really nice showing us around and we saw the Taichung uh, Tower project mm -hmm. and yeah. it's a two-part question. The first one is very simple. Was this the same uh, design that we saw two months ago or has it changed? It's, uh, it's always changing. <laughs> But uh, the end of this month, we have to submit the preliminary design. So we are now fixing the whole design. Because uh, then the second part of the question is, what we saw was a very interesting scheme. It was quite kind of like a development of the serpentine uh, theme, which, which mm -hmm. was with, with this grid kind yeah. of like during the tower. Mm -hmm. And I think it takes a lot of uh, courage for an architect to have something that you know looks work and kind of like is a consistent uh, with what you have been doing and all of a sudden turning it around and and creating something that's really is 
amazing and it's something that you would never have dreamed of. So I would like to know a little bit of that transformation and mm. what prompted that. Yeah, actually, uh, as I showed in the, in the Middle East project, I am enjoying to expand some of my ideas to different situations and like to see how it grows. It is not me to drive or push it forward, but uh, I just put my ideas or some of my ideas in some uh, special situations and wait or to see how it grows. And sometimes it grows amazingly differently. So such kind of a process to create uh, the architecture proposal is the very special characters of my office. So then, that is why I'm just enjoying. If I am doing, how is this, trying to find out some ideas from myself, it's really, f how to say, tiring and scaring things. But I just make a communication with the, the new site, new client, and throughout the communications, and sometimes put the, the basic ideas to that, then the ideas grows. And of course, sometimes to make it grow, to, to water it or to, to clean it or something. But uh, it's more like a, the through the communications. And sometimes, in that case, I can be step back and can see one of my, or some of my ideas is getting so different. And it's very big fun. I don't want to keep my precious ideas as it is, but I like to make it more growing, growing, and travel around, and uh, going back in a really, really different appearance or something like that. So that, that is the, the way I am designing. Great. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Please um, raise your hand. Uh, thank you very much for a very inspiring lecture. Thank you. Um, my question is something related to a previous uh, question. Um, as you develop your own architecture discipline, which was inspired by living in Tokyo and experiencing the uh, cityscape of Tokyo, and you oftentimes uh, emphasize your theory as uh, searching for something in between, something gray or something uh, undefined. Yeah. Um, I wonder if, as because um, oftentimes I see your project in Tokyo or in context of Japan, um, even though your project is not trying to blend into a specific context, but somehow it blends in, even though your project is completely alien to the site. Um, but my question is, as your office is expanding and Obviously, the scale and context is getting more uh, diverse. And um, I wonder if um, participating in such project have influence to uh, your own discipline. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I understand the question is uh, to get an inspiration. I talked to get an inspiration from the context, but the, the final uh, buildings is. Uh, stranger for the context, and how we understand such a gap between the fitting to the context and the, the strange object in the context. And uh, it's a very interesting point of view, because every time I like to get an inspiration from the context and the background, and of course uh, from the discussion with the client, but then what we propose is not just to fit to the context, not just to fit to the the surroundings, but uh, I, if possible, I like to renew the understanding of the context or recreate the basics of the context. So my private house, uh, my design private house, seems so different from the surroundings, but the scales or the atmospheres or some things is continuous, and then it could make it could be the how to say, another starting point to change, to influence the surroundings. Especially in case of Tokyo, the whole context is dynamic. So not it's fixed. So it is, it's one 
something new is coming, then the whole thing has an influence, positive influence, to make it more, how to say, better or sometimes worse. But anyway, kind of a mutual influences is happening. And the recently we have, a, yeah, fortunately, more projects, for example, in Europe. And for example, in Paris, the context is not quite dynamic. It's more fixed and strong. So in that case, it could be more like a, uh, try to, I'm trying to fix, uh, fit into the context, but not just to fit it, but to propose something, uh, something new. Some new lifestyle or some new appearance. Of course, it's a very, very important balance. But anyway, I'm trying to, or struggling to find out, every time, find out such a point uh, of the uh, relation to the context. But it's it's really exciting point, yeah. But I think your work is also very playful, and extremely successful with shaping human behavior or testing mm -hmm. human behavior through its new context. Yeah. So, do we have any more questions? I actually, I, I wish I could just stay for another hour, actually. But um, do we have any questions from the audience? And just in the middle, uh, could you please stand up with a microphone? Uh, I'm an architect uh, from Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. um, Really appreciate the type of, um, you're talking about the transitional space between inside and outside. But uh, one of the very striking projects in uh, Taichung, whereby you uh, superimpose the outline of uh, the Taiwan island uh, on the roofscape, yeah. making a symbol for, for, as a green island. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, that also imposed a very strong political icon into that space. Mm -hmm. yeah. So can you elaborate a little bit about um, between architecture mm -hmm. and politics? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And where and who initiated that idea? You say, mm -hmm. is it your client? Mm -hmm. Or is it your team? Uh -huh. Or anybody else? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, okay, yeah. Actually, the Taiwan Tower project is a really exceptional, exceptional thing for me in several different meanings. And uh, yeah, uh, as you said, for example, the using such a real shape of some things is, I never do that. And that, for that project, I got an idea, that's just my idea, to put the shape of the Taiwan as a void to where people can see, go, uh, look up, was, for me, it was, a, it was for fun, <laughs> in a sense. If we see that kind of tower, it's really abstract things. And if I make pure abstract things from the starting point until the end, it's a bit sad, I thought, because it's a huge thing, and so many people will come. So I like to make some kind of a cute things. <laughs> so if people see the shape of the Taiwan, it's just uh, really fun, I thought. So that was the, the starting point. And of course, I, th I was thinking about, anyway, this could be the, positively or negatively, this could be the icon for the, for the Taiwan or for the city. Then that kind of a really straightforward things could be a nice way to win a competition. <laughs> and then, <laughs> And uh, I am not quite sure such kind of a way is how it works. But I, am, I like to enjoy even such a political uh, situations. Because basically, I believe everybody, usual people, the local people, and even the political people, likes something really fun likes to enjoy their life, I believe. So even the political, we can talk together, joking together, and to make something really exciting things. That could be not so bad things, I believe. So that is my attitude to that Taiwan Tower. Because anyway, we have to make such a huge things. And uh, so at least, we have to enjoy to make it that. That is my uh, current uh, attitude to such uh, problems. 
So thank you. I think um, Fujimoto-san, you really um, challenged the notion of architecture and nature. And I would say, re regardless of his politics or apolitical, you provide such a rich experience um, to the discipline of architecture and discourse. Yeah. And I want to thank you very much for joining us at BODW this year. And let's give um, Fujimoto-san a huge hand of applause. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you.